Karen is awake. They done it. They bloody done it. Greetings. By the way, I'm not fussed if you want to call me Eric SJW101 or anything else. I think you don't mind broad, but I'll just call you Karen. I used to be a non-feminist. Don't explain it all by saying something stupid like... But the more I listened to reason, the more anti-feminist I became. I've been at this actively for about six years and investigating and discussing feminism for almost nine. I have yet to see this possibility of finding common ground come to fruition. Nevertheless, there are issues of common ground. May I make a suggestion made in entirely good faith? If you are genuinely interested in tackling the issues that men face, identify the issues of common ground. Identify issues that will benefit men and women, and show how the implementation of certain policies will benefit society as a whole. Now you might not think that is radical enough, but the only question you should be asking yourself is whether this approach is more effective than your current one. If you, for example, need to ask yourself whether this will cost you support in the MRM, then your priority isn't problem solving. Your success is measured in terms of personal popularity. Before I started my blog and then my channel, I spent a fair amount of time talking to feminists on feminist subreddits and in other feminist spaces online. All I usually got for my trouble was insults and accusations. and a lot of really interesting dishonesty. For instance, way back in 2010, I got into a discussion on R Feminism's subreddit. I think it was about circumcision uh, if I, and, and um, HIV. And there was one commenter that seem to be intentionally misinterpreting everything that I said. I mean, it was obvious that it was intentional, uh, you know, for example. I'd leave a comment that says, a lot of you seem to believe MRAs think all women deserve to be raped. That's just wrong. The commenter would then quote, all women deserve to be raped and respond to that one phrase with outrage and shock. I logged out and discovered that all of my actual comments had been deleted. They were only visible to me when I logged in. Interesting perhaps, but this is not uncommon on the internet. Not tactics that I support, but similar things have happened to me. And trust me, it's worse when people scream from the rooftops about how they support free speech, decry safe spaces, and in the next moment delete my comments, block me, or deliberately misquote me. And in the next breath, some of the very same people then claim that the other side doesn't want to debate. This has happened to me on multiple platforms. I'm not even going to specifically blame anti-feminists for this, even though I'm quite sure that most who did this hold an anti-feminist position. I'm going to blame hypocrites and people that don't like having their views challenged. These people exist everywhere. And they were not visible to anyone else. Interesting, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's interesting, for example, that the anti-SJW YouTuber Atheist Rue blocked me on YouTube for leaving a pretty innocuous comment on Persephone 66's channel. Or interesting how, after losing his temper, free speech advocate Dark Matter deleted a comment section he begun on TYT that I was participating in, decrying the idiocy of those that disagreed with his position. Those are just two mild personal experiences on YouTube from those you would have heard of, but there are many others whose names will be meaningless to you who have done much worse. But you know, water off a duck's back. And then there was also that conversation I had where a feminist went and scooped three or four of my previous comments and did a detailed analysis of all of my mannerisms in order to prove I was really a man and could therefore be ignored since it was obvious I was just a loser who couldn't get a girlfriend or something. It might interest you to know that accusations of me really being a man were so common from feminists I started my YouTube channel 
largely to put the rumours to rest. Well, I'm not sure I believe that is the main reason why you created your channel. A reason among others, perhaps. Consider that a compliment, since you strike me as somebody who has the courage of her convictions, more concerned with arguments than superficial impressions or name-calling. Am I wrong? You do realise at this point, if I was your average trashy anti-femme YouTube hilariously funny content creator, I'd make a joke, in inverted commas, about your appearance. Quick message to your subs, I'm not insulting her appearance, I'm drawing attention to the fact that on YouTube it's the anti-femme creators that are using the type of insults that Karen previously suffered from. Either they are wrong, or what happened to Karen was okay. You decide. All of it thanks to those very first feminists I debated on Reddit who kept insisting I was actually a man or an ugly woman who was just trying to get attention from men. I mean, it's not like the anti-feminist YouTubers don't insult the appearance of feminists all the time. I mean content creators and commenters. But I'm sure you wouldn't know because you're not, um... Oh. It's not like the widespread accusation of white knighting or wanting to get laid hasn't been laid at the door of anybody expressing a feminist viewpoint on YouTube. And let's cast aside the popularity of YouTubers such as Shoe on Head or Blair White and the willingness of those that line up to defend them is strictly because they make intellectually sound arguments. Were they middle-aged men, I'm sure that the rational egalitarians that listen to them would still watch. Aren't you? The teenage-inspired name-calling that is like an epidemic in the anti-fem part of the tubes is so easily exposed, it's barely worth mentioning. But hey, I'm told it's always SJWs that apparently lack self-awareness. I understand that being abusive is part of free speech. Don't get me wrong, Karen. I don't support what happened to you. I condemn it. It's just that the community you're a part of seems to believe it represents legitimate criticism, or at the very least they pretend it's not happening. David Pakman asked specifically for an anecdote, then asserted that my entire position, opposition to feminism was probably based solely on that anecdote, accused me of strawmanning feminism, then grabbed the last word and hung up. That, that's what I get. That's, that's the common ground. That's not the common ground. That's a mistake in preparation. David Pakman will go with what you provide. So even though it seems unfair to you that he referred back to this anecdote, you would have been wise to outline your position from the outset that allowed discussion of the issues. You knew in advance that he holds a position that disagrees with your own. It's about how to handle interviews with journalists, and it was up to you to show what ground you held in common with Pacman. Common ground is not about meeting people halfway or expecting them to moderate their opinions for the sake of it. Common ground is about identifying issues of agreement. We will return to Pacman and we can see your view on his issue-led common ground position later. The feminists who call themselves feminists because they agree with the dictionary definition, they tend to be a little more open to our concerns about feminism. And quite often, they stop calling themselves feminists once they're exposed to those concerns. Don't. More than this, in the UK, if men were treated the way women are treated in the criminal system, it's estimated that five out of every six men currently in prison would not be there. Yes, by the MRM blogger William Collins, whose estimates are dismissed as abject nonsense by journalist Ali Fogg, who can hardly be described as a feminist. Yet in 2010, Madam Justice Hale, on the advice of a report written by feminist groups, mandated that female criminals be treated even more leniently than they already were. She ordered judges and magistrates to d discriminate in favour of female offenders. Her reasoning? A misplaced notion of equality results in some very unequal treatment of women and girls. She didn't do any such thing. For sure, the Daily Mail headline claims judges were ordered to show mercy on female prisoners. In reality, changes were made to the Equal Treatment Bench Book, which is an advisory guide on judicial sentencing. The Judicial Studies Board, which publishes the bench book, quoted Baroness Hale in their advisory. The bench book contains guidelines on what judges should take into consideration. 
Hale has no power to order judges to do what you claimed, nor did she do so. If you want to argue the definition of order in this context, feel free. But you also mentioned her mandate, which is unequivocal and is defined as an official order, decree or edict. This is not accurate. You speak about how much you value accuracy, so I'm sure you'll be grateful for my clearing this up. But I find your exaggerations concerning, because it makes me wonder how many other points you make that you've misunderstood or aren't quite the whole truth. Perhaps you were deceived by the Daily Mail's bullshit headline, as if we need a reminder showing just how deceiving headlines like the wage gap myth can be. And you know what, Karen? I support more lenient sentences for both men and women who have poor mental health or are poorly educated, have not committed violence and have children to look after. That was the reasoning outlined in the rule book, which Hale neither wrote or ordered. I advocate more lenient sentences for non-violent crimes. I hope you would agree with me that the problem here isn't that this advice exists, the problem is that it doesn't appear to apply to men. I believe in branch and root reform of the criminal justice system because it is failing and I don't come to this subject from a feminist or anti-feminist perspective. My interest is in reducing repeat offending and reducing incarceration and men would be the biggest beneficiaries of such reform that I advocate. You think my approach or yours is more likely to get results? Am I not confrontational enough? When MP Philip Davies broke down the numbers on the gender gap in the system in the UK and presented them to a parliamentary committee, he found that the only area where feminists even showed any concern was the one area women suffered more. That is, women were more likely to be sentenced to probation and or fines than men were when he drew their attention to the fact that women receive more fines and probationary sentences than men do because men in the same position are sentenced to incarceration, their only answer was that the law treats men and women equally. I can't claim to know much about Davis's appearance at the committee or have any knowledge about his specific concerns. What I do know about the Conservative MP Philip Davis is that he is against the minimum wage for disabled people and that he opposes gay marriage because he believes it discriminates against straight people. A position I find utterly baffling. I could understand reasoning of being against gay marriage on religious grounds or because one opposes marriage as an institution, but believing gay marriage discriminates against straight people is exactly the kind of extreme viewpoint that makes a person lose credibility that I was referring to. But okay, I will look into his concerns with regard to sentencing with an open mind. This is a topic that is particularly interesting to me, so perhaps we can return to it in future. My guess is that what was meant by the laws being the same is an inference that if sentences are different, this is due to the discretion of the overwhelmingly male judges. The law itself remains constant. Now I've heard before in anti-feminist circles that men are inclined to be naturally more sympathetic to women. Judges are likely more paternalistic than most. I wonder if, at least on this basis, you would agree that more female judges might also help redress the imbalance in sentencing. And from memory of previous research I did on this topic, the idea that male judges are more sympathetic towards female defendants is taken seriously in study of this subject. As for not being confrontational, you're assuming that people like me started out snarling and snapping and swinging our fists. It's actually not how I started out. I've been at this for over six years, and I was a very nice person before that. For my troubles, I got called a fat, angry, neckbeard loser who lives in his mother's basement and can't get laid. Actually, I'm not making assumptions about how you started out, nor does it make much difference if the end result is a binary mindset. It is discussion and not confrontation and insults that help to solve problems. You know this. I've been called all kinds of horrible... Th 
horrible things, been accused of beating my children, and even of sexually abusing my daughter. Well, that's deplorable, but sadly not untypical. Anita Sarkeesian also faced this type of thing. That doesn't make her position any more correct. Speaking of the devil incarnate, there are some issues I disagree with Anita on. In spite of that, and despite being an unapologetic gamer, I never jumped onto that Sarkeesian gravy train. SJW Gamer criticizes Sarkeesian would have gone down great on YouTube. Who am I kidding? Unless I started bandwagoning and calling her a feminazi, I still wouldn't be loved. Woe is me. You've read 1984, Karen, right? See any parallels between Goldstein and Sarkeesian? Apart from the Jewish thing, I mean. Hate can be a useful emotion to tap into to rally the faithful, whether it lasts two minutes every week or 20 minutes, telecast screen or monitor. And of course, in 1984, the hate is top-down, passed from the high-ups to the proles. In real life, it's more complicated. Many see fear and desperation in people and decide to exploit it. Politicians do this particularly well. The media does it to sell copy. There is no reason at all to believe that this doesn't also happen on YouTube, as it does whenever a crowd of discontented people can be exploited. Whether this is done in a calculated way or not is important, but besides the point for purposes of my example. The end result is the same. Manipulation and distortion of the truth, while somebody else profits. The thing is, it's useful to have a single person or single issue which can be blamed for the ills of society. Complexity and nuance go out of the window. All the crowd knows is the name of its enemy. How easy it is to fleece a crowd so fixated upon a single person or single issue and so convinced. Just ask David Serini. They even made a film about it. I've had my channel attacked by false DMCA claims and I've had people threaten me with harm. And oddly enough, the more confrontational and unapologetic I've become, the more popular I've gotten and the less this kind of thing tends to happen. Again, reprehensible, but you are not alone. I know people who have been doxxed and driven from YouTube, people who have been threatened, people who have been swatted, and those that have had their livelihoods endangered by trolls. Now, some of those people are more innocent than others, but I've never believed that two wrongs make a right. Nor have I ever subscribed to the idea that an infraction should be punished above and beyond its due. The more unapologetic I've become, the more popular I've gotten and the less this kind of thing tends to happen. Oh, hooray for bloody-mindedness and hostility, by the way. But seriously, do you think it'll work for me too if I'm, like, bloody-minded and... hostile? You know, I used to consider myself an egalitarian, and now I don't. Not because I don't believe an egalitarian society would be nice, but because I think it's a pipe dream that will never be achieved. So you don't believe in egalitarianism, not because you don't believe in it, but because you don't believe it could happen. The honesty about egalitarianism is appreciated. I wonder if you'll agree with me that YouTube is full of anti-feminists who claim to be egalitarian. I wonder if you'd also agree that those self-professed egalitarians rarely speak or advocate on behalf of any issue related to egalitarianism. Why do you think that is? It seems odd, does it not, to actively claim to support something and yet to create videos that imply the opposite. How much room is there on Twitter for nuance? I mean, how can you do more than what Sargon did? in 140 characters or less. You do realize that the wage gap, as it is described by people like Obama, is actually not real, right? You saw for yourself exactly how. How is it that that guy that corrected Sargon's tweet in about 50 characters was able to accurately explain a skeptical position of the wage gap without using hyperbolic and divisive language referring to the wage gap myth? He constantly implies or insinuates, or even outright states, that women earn 77 or 78 cents on a man's dollar for the same work because of workplace discrimination. Okay, so it's impossible to write the wage gap as described by Obama is not real. Or, Obama's wage gap is not real in less than 180 characters on Twitter then. Good to know. Now you can argue as to whether men and women choose different careers and make different work-life choices that result in different pay because of cultural sexism, or even that different fields earn different pay 
because some are dominated by men and others are dominated by women. The wage gap, as it is presented by people like Obama and lots of other feminists, is indeed a myth. In so much as I understand it, Obama is citing official statistics from the Department of Labor and elsewhere. Does he actually say the shortfall between male and female pay is exclusively due to discrimination? One of the funniest things I've ever seen, and I'll link it if I can find it, was Press Secretary Jay Carney using all the same factors and arguments that Sargon and other anti-feminists use to debunk the wage gap myth to explain away Obama's own wage gap. Female staff at the White House are paid about 10% less on average than male staff. And yet the Obama administration keeps on repeating, 77 cents on a man's dollar for the same work. Today the typical woman who works full time earns 79 cents for every dollar that a typical man makes. And the gap is even wider for women of color. Sorry to be a stickler, but you state accuracy is important to you. You're either relying on outdated information or you are erring on the side of exaggeration for dramatic effect. Either way, I think you're missing the point. Yes, it's hypocritical for the White House to whitewash its figures for its own employees, but how about going a step beyond enjoying their discomfort and compare their 10% gap to the average 21% gross gap? Let me be clear, a net wage gap between men and women for the same work needs to be rectified. As I understand, no study has ever claimed men and women receive the same wages. Whether it's a 5% net gap or 15%, why isn't this a concern to you? There is a wage gap. You are free to debate the extent of the gap with evidence and to postulate why that might be. Which again is so easy to do in 140 characters. What is up for debate here, Eric, is whether the differences in men's and women's earnings are about workplace discrimination, paying women less for the exact same work, which is the position of many feminists, or whether there are other factors involved that can account for the gap. What anti-feminists are saying is that women and men, for the most part, earn the same money for the same work. And they do. Some feminists do indeed claim that the wage gap is entirely due to discrimination, but others believe it is a mixture of discrimination and a multitude of factors, some of which you discussed. Sorry to go back to it, but this is our area of common ground, where we argue numbers and factors. I mean, it is our common ground unless you believe that discrimination doesn't exist in the workplace. If that is your view, then perhaps the wage gap myth is an accurate description of the anti-feminist position after all. It essentially means that the myth is that wage discrimination in the workplace doesn't exist. Not interested in debate. What debate? You have one side, the feminist side, saying women earn 77 cents on a man's dollar for the exact same work. The gender pay gap is not as bad as the 23 cents or even 20 cents on the dollar, realistically. In getting a more meaningful, useful calculation of the pay gap, it's probably more in the ballpark to, uh, of 9 to 11 percent. But this gap is still definitely a huge inequity. And the other side, the non-feminist and anti-feminist side, saying, well, actually, you're basing that figure on apples to oranges comparisons and essentially comparing librarians, who are mostly women, to metallurgists, who are mostly men, and just claiming the difference is due to employer pay, pay discrimination and sexism against women. Shouting doesn't make your point true and we both know that neither of us can proclaim our positions with such certitude. It sounds to me more like you have one side suggesting that wage discrimination doesn't exist or that it should be swept under the carpet and non-feminists and feminists claiming that wage discrimination exists but there is disagreement between them on the extent of that discrimination. You know Karen, sometimes you sound reasonable and I can imagine feminists avoid you unfairly but other times a more radical side emerges. Not only is your Hollywood good guys and bad guys framing of the debate inaccurate as the feminist David Pakman's report showed, it's simplistic and yes, lacking in nuance. 
They don't exist specifically as a group, but I can see we're on the same page of what we mean by the non-feminist side. To summarise, the non-feminist side accepts that there is wage gap discrimination and thinks this is a problem, but rejects the official wage gap figure of 21% being entirely due to wage discrimination. Some feminists believe that the entire 21% figure is due to wage discrimination. Other feminists believe that the figure is lower and that other factors come into play, but think it is a serious problem. Is that fair? Now, rather than my mischaracterizing your position on the extent of wage discrimination, could you summarize it for me? And if you could summarize what you believe to be the consensus position of the MRM, if it is not identical to your own. I would also ask others watching this to give their own opinion. Does wage discrimination exist between men and women? Eric, Obama has been using the 77 cent figure 79 cents to argue in favor of more cumbersome federal legislation that would only correct employer pay discrimination. It does nothing else. That's all it will do. We need to pass a third federal fucking bill. Don't understand why you seem to have blown a gasket there, Karen. I should thank you for the opportunity of using that expression. In my head, it's associated with Trip Tucker from the sadly cancelled Enterprise. But seriously, I don't understand what the problem is with legislation. Are you concerned about the profit margins of private companies and the sanctity of the free market here? Or am I missing something? In reality, when all quantifiable variables are factored in, women earn about the same as men for the same work. And of course, there are some variables that are not sufficiently quantifiable, right, to be included such as likelihood of negotiating starting pay or production per hour of work. I mean, hey, Eric, would you look at all this nuance non-feminists and anti-feminists are bringing into the discussion, and would you take a fucking look? Damn, Karen, you're quite feisty, aren't you? Do you think using the gendered word feisty will get me thrown out of the feminist cabal? Worthy topics for discussion, but as I pointed out, there is an elephant in this room. I won't repeat myself, as I think you know what I'm referring to. Time was people arguing for the rights of homosexuals to not be put in prison were arguing a non-mainstream position. And I'd be right out there in the streets standing shoulder to shoulder with them. You know, an extreme one. Time was people arguing for the emancipa emancipation of black slaves in the US were considered extremists. Ditto. Time was the idea of blacks and whites using the same fucking drinking fountain was extremist and racial segregation was the mainstream position. Disgraceful and a topic I know a fair amount about and not because I took some special black studies module at university where I was indoctrinated into the SJW hive mind, in case your subs are wondering. It was my own research. You know what makes me angry about slavery, Karen? that liberals went along with it. I expect it from conservatives who are resistant to change, but the idea that all these enlightened liberal values only apply to white, upper-middle-class men or to rich women turns my stomach. Those liberal values didn't apply to poor men, poor women and non-whites. But I digress. It's interesting that you mention emancipation of slaves in the US. As a non-egalitarian, what position would you have held on that and racial segregation at the time? I'm genuinely interested if systemic racism has ever been an issue of concern for you. Now, I suppose the difference between someone like me and someone like you is that I primarily care about evidence and accuracy, and you seem to care about how much a given viewpoint differs from the mainstream. A bold claim which your video hasn't supported. I didn't have time to check most of the claims made in your video, but as I established, some of the facts you produced were lacking in accuracy, and some of your evidence was based on biased or incorrect information. When it comes to Twitter, you don't seem to think that accuracy is very important either, although you managed to turn my point into a debate on whether it's possible to write an essay on Twitter. Clearly it isn't. It remains to be seen whether you value accuracy or whether you look for evidence to support your pre-existing view without double-checking its veracity. 
If you are doing this full time, you don't have the same excuses as us part timers skimping for a bit of pizza money for not having accurate or up to date research. Oh, and you really don't know me. Uh, I couldn't care less about the mainstream. And again, I found myself on this platform drastically outnumbered but unperturbed about discussing the issues. Is there a limit to my belief in extreme or whacked theories? Hell yes. There is always a line. There is not enough time in the day to waste on extremism or lost causes that want to remain lost. Depends on what you mean by feminism, Eric. If by feminism you mean the advocacy of women's rights and interests in areas where they are disadvantaged or mar marginalized, then I would agree with you. You like potatoes, and I like potato. You like tomato, and I like tomato. If by feminism you mean an ideology that describes society as being organized to privilege men at women's expense, where violence against women is normalized and encouraged by patriarchal norms, where men hold the majority of positions of power and use that power to benefit men as a group, and where women suffer systemic oppression? Yeah, I, I really don't think feminism is necessary. Seriously, though, I don't care about what you want to call it, feminism or women's rights, activism or anything else. What's important is to tackle injustice. You know, some people would argue that what you advocate isn't far off what you were just criticizing. Do you think that men are victims of systemic oppression? I prefer a societal approach to iron out the imbalances between men and women. My view is that we should be looking at gender issues from the perspective of what will benefit all of us. We are all part of the human species. I will support women where their issues require support and, shock horror, I will support men on issues where they need support. Not only do I think it's not necessary, I think it's actively harmful, divisive, bigoted and hateful. Well, that's certainly the view that some have of the MRM. Rather than wasting your time hating hateful feminists, don't you think it would be more constructive identifying feminists and non-feminists that you can find common cause with? Don't get me wrong, a dose of cynicism can provide the necessary stimulus to get things done, as well as mobilize others. They don't tell you that at school. But on YouTube, it's become an art form. The debate about the necessity of feminism in the West is arguable, but there is no question that feminism is necessary in the majority of countries around the world. Women's rights advocacy is necessary in the majority of countries around the world as are holistic approaches to improving the lives of all people, men, women and children in those cultures. Go Karen, let me just savour this moment. In most of those countries, Eric, life sucks for everybody. Not just women. In Afghanistan, for instance, almost all sex workers are underage boys, and almost all child laborers are boys. Okay, and the reason why this is the case is because those boys have a financial responsibility, a socially and legally enforced financial responsibility to their mothers, to their sisters, to their, you know, to their female family members. I'm pretty sure that life sucks for women more in Saudi Arabia than it does for men. But yes, I'm keenly aware that it isn't just women suffering from injustice in Middle Eastern countries. It's a lot more complicated. Then again, since you seem to think that only men suffer in Western society, you are not taking a societal approach. You see, where we part company, Karen, is that I think that taking this holistic approach you spoke of in the Middle East can benefit men and women in the West. Rather than rejecting the mainstream completely, as you call it, I think that participating in a political process and attempting to influence policies that would benefit society but would actually help men disproportionately is the most effective way forward from your perspective. Some feminists might not thank me for giving you this advice, but I am genuine on this point. And if your example is accurate about what boys do in Afghanistan, while they are out doing this, I can only conclude that many of their fathers are out spending their money fucking young boys. Unless, of course, it's American soldiers driving this trade. But this is tragic, and only one of the many issues facing men and boys of the Middle East. But I'm glad you mentioned the men of Afghanistan and the commitment they show to their families. I'm wondering if you also represent the interests of the mainly male refugees and migrants who go to Europe for similar reasons to avoid being forced into wars or sex slavery of the type you mentioned. 
or to seek work so that they can afford to feed their starving families and escape exploitation. I truly hope that you are representing men from poor countries in the same way that you are representing men from rich industrialized countries. If not, then I'm not sure that your concern for Afghani boys is anything more than a talking point. Are you starting to see why I might be a conscientious objector to feminism at this point? You fight potato, I fight potato. You fight tomato, I fight tomato. Potato, tomato, tomato, tomato. Let's call it all fight.